Hi, and welcome to the first ever Now in Android filmed in the new and hopefully very temporary home studio that I have set up. So a lot of things happened in the last two or three weeks since I did another one of these. Um, so let's just get rolling on them. First of all, Android 11 developer preview two came out. So we talked about this in the last Now in Android. And then in the meantime, developer preview two launched. So briefly, some of the things that are either new in there or touched up since the first preview came out uh, include one of my favorite features in this or many releases, which is IME animation control. So developers have been asking us for this feature for a long time. And frankly, we internally also wanted this, where you know when you need the keyboard on the screen and then the keyboard nicely animates up, but your app does not, your app snaps. Right? It is given a new screen size to adhere to, and it just snaps into the new format. And this discontinuous uh, behavior is something that users would prefer didn't happen, and developers certainly prefer that they had more control over. And now you do have that control in two ways. Right? So first of all, there are callbacks. There's a listener that you can register and get callbacks to find out when the IME is animating in. You can find out what position and size it has so that you can react to that and then animate your own app uh, along the way. Or you can actually control the IME animation directly. So two different APIs to tune into, so check those out. Um, there are obviously a lot of other features in there that aren't just about my favorite feature. Um, for example, the NDK image decoder. So this adds capabilities that are currently in the Java programming language APIs at the SDK level, uh, but maybe you didn't have easy access to those from your native code that you were using. So if you're a native code developer, you either had to up-level, you know, jump through JNI and call these things up at the higher level, or even worse, from an APK size standpoint, you had to bundle somebody else's library in order to decode images. Now you can use the NDK image decoder, decoder directly to decode all kinds of images like JPEG, PNG, uh, GIF, 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 uh, WebP, and HEF, HEF, HIF, however you pronounce that. Let's pronounce it GIF. Uh, so there's an NDK guide on using this thing. There's also a sample. Um, check out texture.cpp in that sample. Links, as always, go check out the article on Medium. They have links to all this stuff, right? Another feature that's interesting is nullability in Android 11. So Colin has this great feature where you can uh, use a language feature to declare whether uh, variables are nullable or non-null, uh, which is fantastic. But what do you do for the Java APIs? Well, there are annotations that can be used in a similar way. And we have, over time, been adding annotations uh, to the APIs at the Java programming language level. And we have added more of those in this release. And we've also enhanced some of those annotations so there's a couple of annotations like recently nullable or recently non-null, which have the capability of those built-in annotations, but they only issue a warning at build time. But we've upgraded some of those to be nullable and non-null annotations, which means you're going to get an error at build time. And then we've also added more uh, for APIs that weren't covered through those annotations already. We've added more recently nullable and recently non-null uh, annotations. So all of that's good, but there's even more in the uh, DP2 release that's worth checking out. First of all, for foldable, there, uh, foldable devices, um, there is a hinge angle sensor. Um, and an API added a hard swish op, uh, which obviously builds upon the swish activation functions, which I mentioned mainly because I just think these names are really cool. Also, there's an intense academic article that covers the background in why swish activation functions are really more powerful, uh, much faster for doing uh, more accurate training. So definitely check out the article and, and an API for those changes. Um, also, microphone and camera are now uh, taking on the same responsibility that we had for location in Android 10, which is if you want to be used in a foreground service, then you need to declare a foreground service type attribute in your manifest. Uh, we actually discussed this in episode 133 of the ADB podcast um, called Power Play. So if you want to hear from the engineering team on some of this stuff and other related things, uh, check that out as well. Another interesting Android 11 feature is the ability to uh, uh, tune into the variable refresh rate capability on devices that support it. And also the emulator now supports cameras that are both front and back facing. Um, so the whole reason that we do these preview releases actually push the release out there way, way, way before it's ready is to give you a chance to react to it, to actually test your app and make sure that A, your app is working correctly and B, our release is working correctly for your app. So do take the opportunity 
test your app out, make sure that it's working, fix the things that need to be fixed, or tell us uh, there are feedback forms on the DP2 or the, the Android 11 preview site um, for you to tell us what is not working correctly so that we can actually get things in the proper shape before we ship the final release. Um, speaking of release, uh, there were obviously a few Android X releases because there always are. Um, first and foremost, Camera X is now beta. So this came out some time ago in alpha form and it's been evolving through those alpha releases ever since. Um, but now it's out in beta. So if you're waiting for the API to be stable, this would be your time. The team is still working on fixing issues going up to the full release, obviously. Uh, but in the meantime, the API will remain stable. So you can depend on that a bit more. Um, some of the things that are interesting in the beta release compared to when it initially came out in alpha includes uh, explicit camera initialization with process camera provider. Um, you can also choose uh, which camera, the front or the back, that should be used for any particular use case. And you can also get more information and more control over specific camera features like uh, zoom and focus. Um, another release that's worth checking out in, uh, in the camera space is um, is actually an alpha release, which is camera view. But this has various utilities and facilities that are specific to uh, use of camera functionality within a view hierarchy. Um, so worth checking out because this might be some of the sort of ease of use stuff that you were looking for, and that's now available in alpha for you to play with. On the stable side for Android X, a few things came out that were mostly bug fix releases. Fragment 1.2.3, paging 2.1.2. I mentioned this specifically because 2.1.1 had a weird sort of build and configuration and push and release issue where some of the APIs came out a little bit too early and they weren't quite done yet. We basically exposed APIs before they were ready. So if you're trying to use 2.1.1 upgrade, use 2.1.2 now, that's gonna be a better choice. Uh, Room 2.2.5 came out, another bug fix release. WebKit 1.2.0, which includes the Force Dark API uh, to control rendering web views in dark mode. And finally, Work Manager, they get bonus points because they released both 2.3.3 and 2.3.4 since the last issue of Now in Android. On the alpha side of Android X, uh, there's one particular one that's worth checking out, which is Activity 1.2.0. This is now in alpha 2. Uh, the new thing in this particular alpha release is the support for Activity Result Registry, um, which allows you to handle start activity for result and on activity result, as well as request permissions and on request permissions result. Uh, allows you to handle these flows without actually needing to override um, the appropriate methods in activity and fragment. So a lot easier to use. If you use that version, then you should probably also upgrade to use fragment 1.3.0, which is also in an alpha 2 release at this point. Many, many articles came out since last we talked. Uh, first of all, Nick Butcher released uh, the next in a series of Android styling articles, and he did this one, Themes Overlays. Uh, this one talks about using theme overlays to set just a small subset of attributes that you might want to set that then overlay, you see where that word is used, overlay the other attributes that are being set by the dominant theme uh, in the hierarchy. Um, app bundle testing is an area that people are interested in, obviously. Uh, ben Weiss wrote an article that talks about how to do that with app bundles. So, Previously, it used to be straightforward to you, you build your APK and then you give the APK to your tester or your testing team and away they go, they test their stuff and, and everything's good. In the app bundle world, you build a thing which is not the APK that anyone would download. So what's the flow? What's the process? for your testers to actually get and use the real bits that they should be testing if you know, we have this indirection through the Play Store. Well, now we provide a testing flow through that indirection process. So now uh, there is a way for your testers to log on and get APKs based on the app bundle that you've built. Uh, and his article goes into details on that. Um, there's also another new feature offered that he goes into depth on in the article um, that allows people to get historical versions of your app. So for example, uh, you can now debug something that is specific to an older version by logging on getting that particular APK and away you go. And it also allows you to test the in-app update flow. You can get that older version, make sure that the in-app update works to a more recent version.
Um, there's also an article on enums using the when statement in Kotlin and also the use of R8. Uh, There's an article that I posted uh, that's based on a talk that I did with Romain Guy at KotlinConf. Uh, it was called Kotlin Under the Covers, Kotlin Uncovered, that was the one, uh, where we talked about all kinds of language features and how some of them are improved through optimizations in the R8 compiler. This one is about the specific optimization that R8 can provide when you're using uh, enums uh, inside of a switch or a when statement and some of the overhead that that sometimes implies. Uh, there's also the suspend modifier. This is an article posted by Manuel Vivo, uh, who uh, explains how the Kotlin compiler transforms coroutines under the hood. So how does this stuff actually work? Um, Yassine posted an a article on storage. So we made a lot of changes to scope storage in Android 10, and this article goes into depth in a lot of those changes. Um, and it also describes some of the changes that we made in Android 11 as well. Uh, Kotlin coroutines, uh, there's actually a three-part series posted by Manuel Vivo and Florina Montanescu uh, on cancellation and exception. So part one does a quick overview of coroutines, in particular describing things like coroutine scope, job, and coroutine context. Part two uh, covers coroutine cancellation. Um, so it talks about how to cancel specific jobs as well as entire coroutine scopes. Um, and it also discusses how cancellation needs to be cooperative. So just because you cancel a coroutine doesn't mean that that thing is going to stop processing the code that it is in the middle of doing uh, in the actual coroutine. So this article talks about some of those details. And then part three finally wraps up the series by discussing what to do when things don't really go as you hoped they would. Um, so how do you actually handle exceptions uh, in your coroutine code? So for example, when there is an exception thrown by a coroutine, it will by default propagate that exception up and could cause the cancellation of all coroutines in your app, or sorry, in the coroutine scope that it's in, uh, cause all of them to be canceled, which is maybe not what you wanted. So how do you then change that behavior and uh, focus or localize the exception to just where it should be instead? Um, there were a few videos that came online uh, in this last little while as well that are worth talking about. First, accessibility. Shailen Tuli and Lila Fujiwara posted a video about accessibility and the simple things that you can do as a developer to make your application more accessible, accessible and useful to everybody. Um, this is one of the longer form videos. I think Nick Butcher did an earlier one a few weeks ago uh, where we basically take content intended for a conference crowd and we boil it down and optimize it into um, a shorter talk, but a longer video uh, that, that covers all the details that you need into deeper topics like, for example, accessibility. Kotlin Vocabulary is an ongoing series um, that a few of us have been participating in, that Florina is running, and there were three more episodes of Kotlin Vocabulary that came out in video form. First of all, Manuel posted suspend functions, which is basically the video version of the article that I mentioned earlier, uh, talking about how all this stuff works. Florina posted collections and sequences, um, which talks about when to use uh, the Kotlin collection APIs um, for eager evaluation versus using Kotlin sequences for lazy evaluation. And then finally, I posted a video version of the article I talked about earlier on the use of enums and when or switch statements and uh, R8. So that's called DA, R8, and enums. So you can check out that video if you'd rather consume the video than the article. Also, Google for Games. So there's this great game developer conference called GDC where we're really looking forward to going. And due to realities, uh, that did not happen this year. So we could not go there. However, we took all the content that we were going to talk about there, including some of the new capabilities that we've just come out with for game developers, and we put it online in a couple of different ways. First of all, there's an article that covers all of the details and much more detail than I'm doing here. Uh, but there's also a playlist on YouTube where we posted both the keynote that we were going to have at the conference, as well as technical sessions that go way into detail and all of this stuff. Um, so there were a bunch of new things that we're offering lately that are worth checking out for game developers, such as native profiling capabilities, um, these are now added to Android Studio's uh, trace tool and the support for native debug symbols in the Android Vitals uh, console. So now you can upload those symbols so you can get more information when there are crashes out in the field and also easier access to Google APIs for Unity developers. 
You can also sign up for previews to check out some of the stuff that's currently in development, including a game development extension for Visual Studio, uh, in case that's your flow and process for developing cross-platform games. We've made it easier for you to then develop Android content uh, in that same tool. And you can also sign up for the preview for a new Android GPU inspection tool. Uh, as I said, there's an article on all this stuff and a YouTube playlist with lots and lots of content there, so check those out. And then finally, ADB Podcast. We've had two podcasts go live since the last episode. Episode 133, Power Play. I mentioned this one earlier. I talked with Amit Yamasani, Makoto Onuki, and Kweku Adams. Uh, and they're all three from the framework engineering team. And we talked all about power, um, things like the heuristics that the system use when it's deciding uh, which tasks to kill. If your application launches and it needs more memory than is available, well, the system has to do something about it. So how does it make that decision? We also talked about doze mode, which is sort of an ongoing effort from the engineering team in general about how to save uh, battery on the system overall. We talked about trim memory requests. So the system is going to send out a call uh, to the whole system saying, hey, it'd be a great time to, to save on memory or else I'm going to start killing applications. So how does that work? We talked about how Job Scheduler works. Job Scheduler is an API at the, at the framework level. We recommend that people use uh, uh, Sorry, we recommend that people use Work Manager actually as a higher level API, which then uses Job Scheduler under the hood as well as some other facilities um, to, to schedule that uh, work. Um, we also talked about App Standby buckets. We talked about foreground services. So lots of things in that podcast to check out. And then finally, episode 134 uh, was just launched last week called All Work and No Play. Um, I talked with Sumir Kataria and Raul Ravi Kumar uh, from the Android Toolkit team about Work Manager. We've had uh, one or both of them on the podcast previously, and this time we give an overview of how all this stuff works, as well as lessons they've learned along the way, as well as some of the new features that have come online since the last time we talked to them. That is it for this time. Uh, thanks for joining me on the video or on the podcast. Please check out the article for all the links. And if you like the video, go ahead and like and share and subscribe to the Android Developers channel on YouTube. Thanks.